because before this, you were in high school. So you weren't planning on what your career path is. And so you get to college and they're like, oh yeah, we well, have like these lanes. But in reality, life is like infinite lanes. Like there's so many ways to make money and you don't even need to choose one, you can choose multiple. So I really wanted to do something that replicated what my life was like as a professional stunt rollerblader. That was the best. I never enjoyed any, like, like nothing in my life up until that point did I ever enjoy more than that. It was, the reason why is because you're an entrepreneur. Welcome back to Capital Hacking. John, what a great show with Nick Uhas. He was amazing. Guys, this is in 2019. He had 267 million. Did you say million? Million on TikTok. He was the number one TikTok in 2019 and the number four overall TikTok watched video. This guy is amazing. He's the host of a Netflix show that's called Blown Away. He's also been on America's Got Talent. He's been on the Today Show multiple times. He's an influencer. He's a YouTube celebrity. Man, you guys are in for it today. Yeah, and if you if you just Google Nick Uhas while we're here, you're going to be blown away like I was, like John was. Now, John, John's known him for a little longer than I have. We're going to find out in this show that we're all in GoBundance together. If you haven't heard about GoBundance, John and I will talk a little bit about it with Nick in the show. And by the way, John, anybody who ever wants to find out about GoBundance can always email us or date Pete what do you call that dm us on capital hacking and we'll we have a secret little surprise if they go through yes. us to find out about that but this is the kind of guy that your kids have watched on youtube if you haven't seen him he did that elephant toothpaste thing yes. but the biggest one ever the world record holding the record is this guy but that's not all we talk about that's like a little bit of what we talk about what we talk about here is completely new mindset for me you know we t- he 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 took the how elrod miracle morning dissected it and actually explained scientifically why things like visualization are not hocus pocus they're science yeah how it puts your brain synapses together it does and then he talks about what he's doing now and how he's he's taking and he's aggregating all kinds of creatives and why he's doing that then he talks about you know his intentionality you'll he'll he'll give you a blueprint actually he calls it reverse engineering where he'll explain to you how to dominate in a lot of different areas. In his world, it's media influence, which then turned into business domination that turned into life design. So I thought those were really great takeaways as well. Yeah, and I loved his base camp example where it takes a certain number of tools to get to 5,000 feet, but that's your base camp. And then then to get to the next one, the 10,000 feet, you have to use different tools. And you're gonna always have to change. And if you stay till the till the end, you're going to find out he gives us a prize. He gives away a gift at the end. And then he shares with you and I how he is asking for all of us to get involved in his world. I thought that was cool, too. Yeah, really great. You're going to love this episode. Let's go. Thank you, buddy. Woo-hoo! Bro, it happened, Let's John. Go. John, Nick is here. Nick, you Yes. Us. Welcome to the big show. Nick, you us. Brother, thank you so much. I appreciate it. I really do. Okay. Well. For those of us that are unbaptized by your wisdom yet or by your prowess on the media, could you tell a little more about what you do, where you're at? Do you have a family? Tell us a little bit more about Nick Uhas in your own words. Yeah, I'm going to try to go like super blast, like from like where it started to where we are right now. I started out the whole thing awesome. as a professional stunt rollerblader, just like skateboarding, but with rollerblades. That got me involved in media. I was studying biology at the time in college. I was going to go to medical school, and then I studied very briefly at Yale University. Totally changed my track. I ended up getting into media, so then I worked on a feature film, shot at Yale University. Then I worked at College Humor in New York City, got my sort of footing Mm -hmm. for like hosting, acting, a little bit of everything. Went on the show Big Brother as a contestant, started a media company. Did that for roughly, have been doing that for 10 years in LA while I was also a contestant on America's Got Talent, then became a host of a reality TV show, 
which is Blown Away, which is on Netflix. And then also this random discovery one, which is about rockets called Rocket Around the Christmas Tree. Great for holiday time viewing. And then throughout that whole process, I've been building my social media presence as a science communicator. So someone, Sweet. if you can think, if you're a little bit older, I'm like kind of, you know, just to paint the picture, it's like Neo Bill Nye, right? So it's like Bill Nye of the past is sort of like, there's tons of creators now in this space that are all doing their own independent little niches. I'm one of those people, big, explosive science experiments. It's like the fun side of science is what we create on TikTok and on YouTube. Now, amazing, Nick. I want to go back for a second. America's Got Talent. What did you do on that show? Okay, so there's a little bit of backstory for how I even got here, okay? So I thought, there was just a strategy. I thought that if I could go on the Today Show a bunch of times, I could build my social media prowess more. So like, I thought I could like build it, build subscribers and sort of get more press. So I, at the time, was doing what are called like demonstrable science experiments. You know, you kind of like, like all the fun stuff we remember in science class, you know, like I'm going to put hydrogen in this balloon and we're going to blow it up. And like, that's, you know, combustion. We're going to talk about that and like what happens. And so I started doing that just for YouTube and I really wanted to get on the Today Show. So I had a friend who was a professional stunt rollerblader who lived in Sydney, Australia. Mm. And I actually, through a friend of a friend, through my girlfriend at the time, knew a guy named Carl Stefanovic, who was kind of like the lead anchor of their Today Show, the Australian Today Show. And I got in touch with him and he saw one of my YouTube videos and said like, I want this guy to come on. But like, they weren't gonna play for my flight. They weren't gonna like bring me out and put me up in a hotel. So I hit up my buddy who lived in Australia, Kate Anderson, and I said, dude, please, like, can I come to Australia and I'm going to go on the Today Show like with Carl Stefanovic and Kelsey Wilkerson. And he was like, yeah, no sweat, man. I got you. It had been like years since we'd gone on tour together. We said, I got you. You come out here. So I paid for the whole thing myself. I put it all on Sky Miles. I just did everything. <laughs> and I went on the Australian Today Show. So then I leveraged that. By the way, I did a deep voice gas experiment. I did an elephant toothpaste experiment and I did like a flamethrower, I believe. It was like, <laughs> you yeah. know, all the fun stuff. And so I had that little tiny kernel of, you know, it proved that I could do live television science experiments. So the first thing I did when I came home is I immediately pitched it to the original, like the actual Today Show, like the American one. And they just so happened to have this thing coming up. This is great timing. It was called Wow Me Week. And they were like accepting all sorts of submissions. And so I got in for Wow Me Week and I did the same exact set. So deep voice gas, I think we did elephant toothpaste and then one other experiment. And it was a total, it was just like grand slam. Like all the hosts like loved it, like great reactions. And so they said, we're like opening it up to you. Like this is like an open invite to the Today Show. If you, whenever you want to come back, like second or third hour, just like you come back. And I was just like, mine were just blown. So I was like, oh my gosh. So I didn't actually have enough experiments. <laughs> I, I, I like just started this. So I was like, oh shoot. So I'm going back to the lab, you know, and I'm like, you know, drumming it up. And by the way, I didn't even have this thing yet. This is like the thing that I love. And I've built this like space before that. I was living in an apartment and I'd shoved all of my like tools in a closet and I had to pull all of the tools out and into a Jetta in the back of a Jetta in plastic yeah. cans and drive 45 minutes to Glendale to do experiments in the backyard of our friend's house. Like it was a terrible setup. So it was very long and didn't, wasn't very conducive to what we were doing, but I just like muscled through it. And I actually did the Today Show 10 individual times. Damn, and like, wow. by the time I got to the end of it, I was like seeing diminishing returns. I was like, okay, like I have just done this so many times now, I feel like, Y'all should be paying me now. Like, I'm just like, I'm like a segment <laughs> awesome. producer for the show. And so I had got what I needed, you know, from it. And then I had gone on like that Dr. Oz show. And like, I had like, it had definitely worked for what I was doing. But in that NBC to NBC, the uh, America's Got Talent airs on NBC. So one of the, essentially one of the people that worked at America's Got Talent was like, hey, we love what you did on today's show. Come on to a GT and like do your set. And so I actually, I did the set on my birthday. And so I made it past like whatever the, you know, the trial or the auditions is what they call them. I went on to the second round and I got eliminated on the second round by the famous singer Seal, the guest host. And so 
Yep. I was not kissed by anything. <laughs> but yeah, kissed no by problem. a rose. Is that oh, what he's for? <laughs> yeah, kissed by just case. He just like, he was like, nah, not good enough. And so that was it. I was toast. So that's kind of like my track record too, by the way. Like I always go like two rounds. Like I only went two weeks on Big Brother and I only went two rounds on AGC. So not you know, exactly a successful contestant. Yeah. Well, game shows are what they are. But here's the thing. We're jumping in today, partially as the listeners are listening, you know, Nick is extremely talented, uh, has done so much in the world of YouTube, as we all know, and TikTok, even more in TikTok, over combined 300 million views, your elephant toothpaste record setting experiment. By the way, so many of the people that have children like I do are probably going, wait a second, is that the guy? Yeah, he's that guy that did yep. the gigantic elephant toothpaste. So now we all have a visual in our mind. We're all driving around the, the country and we're trying to picture you, Nick. And we love this that you're on. And it, sometimes people watch us on YouTube, but a lot of times it's on Apple uh, Podcasts. So let me ask if you could for a second. There's so many things you dropped in there about a strategic step-by-step -step process. Your mind saw the end before it started. You knew, I'll paraphrase, you knew that if you got on the Today Show, it would accelerate your credibility on social, yeah. your social platform would build. And then some of the other things were serendipitous, but you had an intentionality. So 100%. where did that come from, Nick? Like, how did you, first of all, go back a little bit in your heart? Why was this your calling to be part of media and now science? So it's so interesting because like this comes up a lot in media because in media, it always feels like you hear these stories where people are like, I was working as a waiter and like the director came up to me and said, hey, kid, do you want to be on this movie? And then like, they're like, they just type this like one thing in the memoir of the book. It's like, and then the rest is history. And you're like, what? Like, that's the one part that like I want to know the most. Like, what do you mean the rest is history? Like, yes. it's that part. And so all of the things that I have done have been very intentional. And the reason why, and I'll explain this, is that the, one of the reasons why I got into where I am now was because I really, truly loved biology and the sciences. And so I, I really thought that I was going to become a physician. But after working in the hospital for so long, and I was an anatomy TA, I was you know, I worked with, uh, like, I became a published chemist in organic chemistry. Dang. I worked in a lab under this guy mm -hmm. named Dr. Callum, doing really, like, nerdy stuff. We were building complex carbohydrates out of D-manus. Of the course. Animal. Well, I do that. I did that earlier today. Yeah. Everyone yeah. Does. So, like, I, like, love learning. And that's really the concept of science. It's like, you're always digging deep. Yes. I really love to learn. I love biological sciences because I feel like it explains a lot about our physical world. So there's just kind of this, like, really strong curiosity around the sciences. But I did not want to be a physician. I just like didn't want to be a doctor. It just like, and in college, you don't, it feels like this very narrow path. Yes, it it's does. like doctor, lawyer, CPA, like that's sort of what's offered because it's all you know, because before this you were in high school. So you weren't planning on what your career path is. And so you get to college and they're like, oh yeah, we have like these lanes. But in reality, life is like infinite lanes. Like there's so many ways to make money and you don't even need to choose one. You can choose multiple. So I really wanted to do something that replicated what my life was like as a professional stunt rollerblader. That was the best. I never enjoyed any, like, like nothing in my life up until that point that I ever enjoy more than that. It was the reason why is because you're an entrepreneur. So it, in the extreme sports, it's a little bit different than let's say like the NBA or the PGA or NFL, those are very structured in the sense that like the recruiter does this, you go to this school, like your coach does this. In the extreme sports, there is nothing. There is like no coaches. There's no like, there are circuits. There's like things that like kind of piece it all together, but there is no structured event. It's just totally up to you. Yeah. And like people will tell you this for sports, snowboarding, skateboarding, you name it. It's all just, it's all in your shoulders. It's like, a little bit of a solopreneur, there are like sort of yeah. teams and groups and stuff. But that part of it, I really enjoyed. I loved the sport of it. The part where if you trained, you could mentally visualize mm. something and you could create it. And then you became the thing mm. that you were visualizing. And then you were able to sort of like rise up the ranks in this system by doing strategic things. You could get better at your skill. You could be more prevalent in the media sources. You could be more a part of the industry. You could strategically move yourself closer to where the magazines are being shot. Like there was all these little strategy plays that you could do. And I seemingly just by the will of wanting to be a professional rollerblader, rollerblader learned how to do that. So that skill to me saying like, okay, well, you don't get this in medicine to my understanding. And I could be totally wrong with that, but like to my understanding, this wasn't 
the main oomph in being an orthopedic surgeon. It was like, follow this track. You know, you go to this school, you go to this residency, you get this job at this, you know, hospital, and then boom. And I'm sure you could, you know, create your own practice, that kind of thing. But like, that wasn't the meat of it. Like the meat of it was like, I wanted to create something. So while I was at Yale, I went into this like super deep dive. And I always say that I was at Yale because I was finally away from Ohio. At the time I was going to Ohio State. I was going to the Ohio State University. I was separated from my fraternity, my family, my friends. And I could think very independently. And I started piecing together this life plan. And I started looking in hindsight, hey, who do I want to be like? Okay, cool. What did they all do? And they all did a couple of things very similar. It tends to, they were all entrepreneurs. They were all involved in media. They all dipped at least somewhat into real estate. And then eventually they did something where they gave back, right? That was sort of the arc of their life. Like they either got into public service or they had like this big philanthropy event or something of this nature. And I thought, that's it. That's my course. That's the arc. Let's do it. So I reverse engineered this thing and I was like, all right, like these people have done it. This is their highlight reel. Let me start to study them. And so it was like Tony Robbins, Oprah, Arnold Schwarzenegger, Rob Gierdick. Like these are people that I was like looking at and piecing together the similarities so I could kind of like triangulate what is it that they did to get to where they are. And like you start to find all these commonalities and you start to realize, oh my gosh, there's this whole other like equation. There's this whole other like life hack. And that life hack is basically that once you are, in, you know, you have an attention to a goal that then you're bushwhacking, right? So you're going through, you're charting your own course like this, but it seems to all be going in one direction. You know, like the mountain is in front of you. And eventually, if you just keep doing that for like as long as you possibly can, and even if it's boring, you will eventually end up at the summit of the mountain. And so it's like that I achieved in wrestling and in stunt rollerblading and now I'm applying it to media. And so it's like, it's the same blueprint. You're just changing the thing, whatever it is, whatever mountain you're climbing. So it's been very strategic. Nick, first of all, thank you for that share, man. That was a lot to digest. And it was, you said it masterfully. You articulated that really well. So what I got from that is rollerblading kind of gave you this space of creativity and you took your love for medicine, combining that, right? And now you're also teaching kids, man. Kid, Like my three kids, they've seen you on TikTok, by the way. And it's awesome because you're getting other young people yeah. to love science. And that's part of your give. You know, I also love that you said, you know, as you're climbing the mountain, you had not just the vision, but you had people who you were looking towards that were kind of your role models. So my question is, what is the next mountain that you visualize yourself climbing? Yes, and thank you for asking this because it is really interesting. Sometimes like as you're climbing that mountain, you may hit a couple base camps along the way and then you're like, all right, well, if I really want to hit the summit, I'm going to have to change my strategy because what got me to 5,000 uh-huh. feet is not going to get me to 10. Hmm. And you start to realize that you're like, Man, like you sometimes you realize, like, I can't just muscle my way through it. That strategy is not going to work, like diminishing returns here. So you've got to start learning different strategies. And, and the new strategy that I'm particularly working on now is like, I have been a solopreneur in the sense that I hosted the videos, I produced the videos, I hired a freelance team, but it was mostly all revolving around me. And so now with the birth of the science factory, the idea is I wanted to look at the biggest problem to solve within my micro industry of science communication. And I found that actually to be that other people who were earlier on full-time communicators, they either were struggling with branded content, they didn't understand the mechanisms of how to monetize. I realized that there's a lot of, the, generally speaking, there was a lack of community. There was like, you know, people would say all the time, oh, I love doing this, but hey, doing this by myself. And sometimes like I have these really, you know, I, if I just could talk to somebody that could, They would save me hours of research and I could just be like, oh yeah, duh. Like, I don't know why I didn't think of the catapult should go like this and you know, whatever it is. (laughs) And so, because it's such a niche. And so I started percolating on what would that look like? What would someone, how would someone lead to where it could provide value for these other people? And then how could I essentially organize that to be more beneficial for my company too? And so that became the birth of the Science Factory. The Science Factory is an aggregate of lots of creators 
And sometimes we partner fully, you know, financially, or we partner just in, you know, exchange of IP and they're a part of it. They're just a part of the community and that helps, you know, all boats rise scenario. So now like I'm really looking more towards how can I build like a structure, like a small micro community of science communicators, because really the value that I can add back to them is truly all the things that I've learned to get up to this point. And I think honestly, that is the next step for me is to learn how to be a better leader in that space. Jeez. How long ago would you say you began that part of your life, the Science Factory and this initiative? I would say probably about a year and a half ago is when we technically rebranded. So we like officially changed the name, got the trademark. We started visualizing, because I do a meditation every morning, and started really visualizing what that looks like. And we look, okay, here's like very, it's like completely serendipitous, but it was like, you know, I'm always saying, I want to be like these people. One of the people is Rob Deerdeck, listening to a lot of his podcasts, listening, just really studied him. And he created the Fantasy Factory for a collaboration with MTV. And so we started thinking like, like if I were to describe this, it'd be like Mythbusters meets Rob Deerdeck's Fantasy Factory. Cool. That would be like this like cool place you walk into. And, you know, there's the chemistry girl. There's like the physics guy. And he's working on something. Someone's welding in the background over there. And then, like, <laughs> you know, it's like this like live like thing going on. And people are creating content and borrowing concepts and helping each other. Because like, this is super random. But like, for example, sometimes I'm like, oh, I need someone to weld aluminum. But I don't weld aluminum. That's not like really what I do. If we have the person that's like the aluminum welding guy and you can, you know, he's a part of this sort of like cohort, your concept can just sail, right? It's like now you're a part of this team that can make these concepts happen very quickly. Someone's so that, blowing glass, I think, in that factory as well. Do we need a glass blower? Is that what you said? <laughs> <laughs> we should probably have one. You know, if I, if John, feel free to jump on me anytime you want, but I, I wrote down like three or four things that you could write a, at least a book about, or at least an article. Early on, I asked the simple question that it sounds like you were intentional from the beginning, though, from an outsider's point of view, it looks like, man, you hit singles, doubles, and triples, and even some home runs almost all the time. That's what it looks like. But you, it's like you did that intentionally. You knew that if you hit this single, it would create that double and you created momentum. So there's an expression you said early that I think we should at least comment on because I know you and John and myself, I'm probably not at the level you two guys as far as become your visualization. That concept about goal setting, rigorous discipline to get there. I thought you threw out another concept that you have to bushwhack through it. You know, you have to have this entrepreneurial initiative, but then you have to bushwhack. You said, this is a life hack. You have to have a clear intention. You have to bushwhack, bush hack or whatever you said to get there. So it, sometimes it looks like you made a mistake. You went over here, but you created these new relationships that allow you to make another 45 degree angle and get over there. And now you're at a new, and then you referenced, I'm layering all your metaphors. Then you referenced base camps yeah. as you're climbing the mountain and you're at a different base camp and you realize this may not get me to the peak. All of those metaphors and concepts speak to this idea of building your own life and building what you believe you were called to do. And science does seem to be a common thread, even though you're fun, you're engaging, you could be a media person in various categories. I love the combination of your athleticism being in, you know, what is that? Extreme sports rollerblading. So anyway, I'm putting together a, like a book about motivation and a, bo a book about <laughs> yeah. achieving goals. Yeah. And this is capital hacking. I will let John, do you have anything you want to say? Because I want to add something later. Yeah. Well, this is totally off the topic, by the way. How did you come up? Now, I understand you had the elephant toothpaste and other guys had done that, right? And you blew it out the water. Like literally you blew it out the water. It was amazing <laughs> watching you guys sprint away from that. But my question is, how did you come up with the creativity to create that like cyclone rainbow thing that you did? So this is off topic of what Josh, <laughs> but I, I'm just a fan, by the way. How did you come up with that idea? Interesting. So within, and I'm sure of this, if you were to go into any one particular industry, you would find if, and I'm just going to throw this out. I don't know what industry this is, right? But like, let's just say it's golf. Okay. And like someone says, like, I've mastered this swing. And the first time you ever saw it was on ESPN. And you'd be like, oh, this is the guy who invented that swing. Yeah. Turns out I can guarantee you that swing is probably very prevalent across a multitude of different golfers. And that it was probably invented like 70 years ago. And that it just so happens that this is the, your first experience with it. This happens a lot in media. So the first person to like present it to the whole world, it, it was either the most famous video, the most viral, the biggest platform, whatever. 
turns out that person probably didn't invent it and like had made like one or two iterations or maybe none at all. And they became known as that thing. Like, yeah, no, we like did not invent the elevator space. Like we did not invent the multicolored fire tornado. Cool. Some of the things we did though, is we just tweaked it just a little bit, right? To make it our own. And then yep. that was it. So for example, with the elephant toothpaste, I had come up with a formula that had like very much spent way too much time going through about what the best formula is with very specific chemicals, potassium iodide as the catalyst and 35% hydrogen peroxide as the actual like material that's going to make the oxygen. And so we just, and a very specific soap and a very specific diet and never changing mm. that formula. And we just kind of knew. And then also the really actually the way, the mechanism in which it actually happens, we figured out that there's a certain mechanism that just makes it look cooler than all other ways of doing it, right? There's a certain amount of volume that happens in a specific cylinder. Like, I don't know what it is specifically, like in the, whether it's the chemical or if that's just the device, but it always looks really cool when it happens like this. So we didn't invent that, but we just figured out this one little thing that looks really neat. When it comes to the column of fire, which is essentially a fire tornado, I've seen colored fire tornadoes with boric acid. Boric acid turns, there's boron in boric acid that burns green. You, if you use a very light colored flammable liquid, we use methanol, it burns blue, but very dimly. Like it just doesn't give off a lot of lumens. You can, it just vibrantly looks green. Now you, you do the same thing with lithium, dissolve lithium metal in methanol. It will burn super vibrant pink, like, like neon pink. But if you combine them, weirdly, they burn at different rates, like through the methanol, like they don't burn at the same time. So you get like shoots of pink, shoots of green. Dang. And you, blue in there too yeah. and so we just we're just kind of screwing around and we're just like we already had gasoline on the fire tornado device and so it just sort of happened to mix so then we were getting like red green orange it was just like weird and it just yeah. looked so cool it was yep. like a total mistake like we didn't really intend for it to like be quite like that we knew we would get some concoction of that but yeah it just turned out to look way cooler than what we anticipated it was amazing so you mentioned about meditation and visualization in the morning. Can you run through what your morning routine looks like? Because this is a common thread among very successful people across the world. So what do you do in the morning? For sure. So again, this is going back exactly to this like golf analogy, right? Like so-and-so did not invent the swing. Sure. Hal Elrod yep. came up with a concoction of basically mm -hmm. what works, right? Mm -hmm. Like he did what I did sort of like career path wise. He pieced it all together. So he just like served on a silver platter. And so Rob Deerdick also does something. He does a daily energy tracker. So like instead of like scribing, like journaling, yeah. I do yeah. like daily energy tracker, but it's the exact same thing. So I can walk you through exactly what the morning is like. Please I do. Wake, I brush my teeth. I put the coffee on. I take my Bose headphones. I find that I fall into like a better meditative state with no sound. I put the Bose headphones on. I, first of all, I look at the goals that I've posted above my computer. So I see them. I say them out loud. There's this really interesting thing. I think this is in Hal Elrod's book. He says that the Japanese conductors, they point and then they say out loud, like the lever is in the on position in this like dramatically reduced, essentially like accidents. Say what the goal is out loud in my own voice. You know, like I will raise X amount of money. I will do this. And so then I hear that I say it, I see it. I immediately go straight into the visualization, which is about 20 minutes. And I do a couple things. I just try to mix it up. One thing I do is I imagine my life with all of those done. And I go through the same routine. Like I'm waking up, going through, I'm getting in my, you know, flat gray Porsche Macan S. I'm leaving my house in Tarzana Hills, of which I don't have any of these things, by the way. And then I'm going to the science factory. I'm doing the daily morning check-in with the team. What does the team look like? How many computers are there? What are we, who interrupts me, you know, and says, oh my gosh, you got to take care of this email and then where my office is. Like, I see it so crystal clear that my behavior and patterns tend to like then you know, you're foreshadowing Dang. that in front of you, then I'm done with that. Or the other thing I'll do is I'll just, I'll focus on one like issue with that like timeline and I'll think it through. And some of my really good ideas happen in the morning. No, I, I didn't. I just, when you, is, I don't want to interrupt your program there. If there's more to it, all I was going to say is why do you think scientifically that pattern that you created in the morning works? I mean, this is something oh. you've probably reflected on yeah. For those of us that understand Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning, which you were referencing earlier, we've felt it work, but why yeah. do you think it worked, Nick? So 
I think, and there's this other book. This is actually something I was going to, I'm jumping the gun here. This is my give back, right? I want people to read this other book that was very similar and had a very similar impact. And it is called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Really breaks down specifically why these kind of things happen. You're recreating neural pathways. So what you're doing is you're roadmap, you're bushwhacking in your <laughs> own brain before you're doing it. So what happens is that you have millions of micro decisions throughout the day. But if you've already turned your two lane highways into the four or five, like mainstream highways, like neurologically speaking, the cars are running, the cars are analogous to the way that the electron signals are going, electronic signals are going, you have created the path that you keep seeing, that you keep acting upon. So when things come up that aren't on that highway, they don't interrupt that signal. Like the cars go that route all the time. And you're, you're blueprinting the freeways before they're freeways. So then your micro decisions then literally build the freeways in real time in the real verse, this thing, you know what wow. I mean? Like, so then I think that's why that happens. And that's why I think visualization is so important because you're building your future truly. Like, Dude, drop, drop the mic. I mean, I think you just scientifically d defined what we have felt. Many of yeah. us who've chosen, and I'm not, like I said, John, forgive me, as you always know, I admire you and your incredible goal setting skills. That's a real gift that you have that you always teach me. And this visualization is, the, I guess, the accompaniment to goal setting, correct? Is that a good way to think yeah. of it? Yeah. So, it's like, so yeah. Go ahead. I, I'm sorry, Nick. So, you know, one thing that that I know about you that the audience may not, and Nick and I are personally friends, and Josh and I are personally friends, and we're all part of an amazing organization called Go Abundance. Maybe we'll talk about it. Maybe we won't. But I called Nick the other day. And I wasn't getting through. And I'm like, what is up with this guy? Now, he's also on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. But, you know, I also do a morning routine, as you guys know, and it's a miracle morning. Hal Elrod's a friend of mine. But the great thing is, and I do it too, Nick puts his phone away. You can't contact Nick during this time. There is no distracting Nick during this morning routine. And it's the same way with me. So, Nick, talk about that a little bit, how it's so important to put that phone away. Yeah. So there is probably like your focus is so important. It is no different than where like, let's say it's totally dark outside. Okay. And you have one flashlight. This is the analogy to your focus. You can only see like one thing at a time. Right. So like the phone is this thing that just like, it just takes your focus immediately to it. You're always yeah. staring at the phone, your brain, your psyche, you go, everything goes into your email and the social media and it's so distracting to the point to where it's like, they're almost like you're living like two different lives. It's like your life in your phone and then like your life in real life, you know, like outside of your phone. So I think specifically putting your phone on silent mode or just keeping it on silent mode, which is what I do. I oh. never have it on. There's a list. There's like a list of like emergency contact people that like can call me, which I just gave away my, you know, you'll know if you're getting through now. Like if you're on the call list. <laughs> well, thank like, you. Basically, basically. <laughs> I'm offended. But like the reason why is because let's say you're deep in thought and you're blueprinting and you're constructing. It's like, you know, coming into the construction zone and being like, everybody stop. And you're like, what? What? And then like, look at this really cool video of, you know, the puppy, you know, and then it's like, everyone's like, what is like, we're welding and we're building, we're constructing stuff. It's like, okay, okay. And then you leave. That's like the phone. Like, it's just so distracting. And it's so like, you know, it just throws everything off that you can't really do great things when you're that distracted. You need really good amount of time for your brain to like linearly think and work through problems. You need like 20 minutes at a time, 30 minutes at a time. And I think it's like when you're driving, you know, like late at night or you're driving somewhere and you're listening to the radio and you're not really focused on your phone, you're able to think yes. so well and problem solve. And it's like, just give that back to yourself. Like you have the control to do it. Just give it back to yourself. Give your time back to you. I'll tell you what, Nick. I mean, this episode, we knew approaching a media giant like yourself, John and I would not have control over this awesome show. It would go down three or four different paths. Yeah. I jotted them all down for the commercial at the beginning of the show because they're like incredible focus and the flashlight metaphor and the brain bushwhacking. And <laughs> there's some really great stuff here, John. Thank you for uh, recommending the world famous Nick Uhas to get on the ca Capital Hockey. But I want to tie up one thought, if you don't mind, from my point of view, and then you can comment on it. So we, over the years, we've been meeting, you know, the audience of Capital Hacking and growing this and trying to develop it slowly, by the way. We're like you, we're intentional, but we're not rushing it. We're like four years into it. Eventually it'll even have all kinds of different tentacles. 
but I've been writing, just like you said, every night I drive about an hour and a half home mm -hmm. and I have chronicled all these different wisdom truths that have come from conversations with gentlemen like you yeah. and ladies. And one of them was this word syndication. And a lot of you brought it up. You called it syndication of creators or syndicate yeah. of creators is what you're doing in Science Factory. See, this is one of the ways we try to explain capital hacking. It's human creativity will attract financial capital. But this whole idea of how it works, by the way, the key word is syndication. Now, yeah. I, I actually do syndicate cash to buy buildings, but forget the cash. John, I always think about this. First, you have to syndicate the team. Yeah. So really, it's human capital syndication first. In your case, it's the creators in one syndicate will create an exponential, you know, one plus one will equal five because of the shared capital, the power. And that's, you know, I've had, uh, we've had uh, David Osborne on here and he always talks about financial capital as like stored energy. And that's it's another way to understand capital. It's not just cash. That's what I, John, you and I, I grew up pretty humbly. I think you probably did too. Yes. So the word capital, and the reason why I bring it up a lot here in this explanation was so ethereal. It was kind of like only the rich people use that fancy word. The rest of us called it money. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we called it money. They called it capital. But actually over the years, I came to understand what they, the reason they're saying that is because it's more than the money. It's yeah. this potentiality, this power. And it starts with these kind of conversations, Nick. And some people join me and we call this the audio mastermind for a lot of people. John, not everybody gets to be in Go Bunnit. So we'll parlay this conversation into what a mastermind is because what we're doing now, Nick, and what John and I are doing with you is we're exploring how you've achieved things through discipline, through intentionality, through a morning routine. This is what a mastermind kind of does, right, John? It just yeah, it sends us on a new trajectory and opens a door that we didn't even know was available. And right. so I'll let you take it from there. Yeah, thank you for all that collective wisdom that you shared, Nick. So so what are you looking at next? What's the next big goal for Nick, for the Science Factory? Where do you see that? Thank you for asking that. I just want to, I want to like, you guys mentioned GoBundance. GoBundance is very equivalent to how Hal Elrod, he like, he basically took what worked and he put it and he organized it into something, which is a book. GoBundance is kind of like organizing a group of people that, are all willing to help each other, but then also willing to share the idea of what works. And so it's interesting because like mastermind, and it sounds like it always makes me think of like Doctor Evil. They're like, so like you know, it's like a round table, and it's like how we're going to take over the world. <laughs> it's really interesting because when I explain it, it's not fully financial. Finances are a good route to get to where you're going, right? Like they can provide that that you know, we'll say it, capital to like fulfill the thing that you're working on. But a lot of the other side of the equation is actually more like emotional and spiritual. And if you don't have those things, then the capital doesn't really matter because if you're not really in a good, fully healthy headspace all the way around, like you have friends, you're doing fun stuff, you're excited about the day, then really like there's not enough money in the world to make you happy. So that's another sort of really interesting cool thing about a mastermind. It's not specifically financially focused, although new members like myself, like when we jump in, like we're like, oh, you guys like money. But like it turns out that like there is definitely an aspect to it about that because with money, it allows you more time. You're essentially buying this sort of time transfer. You get more and more on back. And what you can do with that is like your family, you could do something to your community, you could do whatever you want specifically. And so I know that's we're going way off on a tangent, but I found that through abundance, that my trajectory for what's next has actually kind of changed a little bit because I realized like now that I'm plugged into this other thing that is essentially the same equivalent to the science factory, but just in a different realm of my life, right. I now have the power of the syndication that I'm like, oh my God, like exactly. I need to like restructure some of these goals because. You know, what me doing this as like a solo person was like kind of, it sounds terrible, it was like kind of weak. You know, it was like, eh, like that's not that big a deal. Like, you know, you can do that with the power of the team, you can do a lot more. So I'll share what that is, but yeah. Yeah, Nick, it was fun being the guy to go through your application and have the conversation interview with you for GoBundance. And, and then you joined and 
the first thing I said was welcome to the matrix, uh, <laughs> which I think you're finding out because, you know, it's like you said, it's this collective wisdom. I mean, how's, how about your GoPod, right? I was on my GoPod earlier today and these guys are just so smart and I'm like, always an empty cup when I'm around them. Yeah, it's amazing. Thank you for that share. Okay, yeah. So just to explain like what a GoPod is, because this is, <laughs> it's like people in GoBundance, they throw these terms out like all over the place. And I'm like, oh, a GoPod is essentially, it's like four or five people that you speak with regularly as in like same time every week and they hold you accountable to your goals. That sounds very formalized. A lot of times it breaks into like, hey, I got this problem this week or like I'm gonna share some highs and lows. And it's, you know, you're essentially doing like a mini mastermind for your right, micro right. goals instead of your macro goals. So like, for example, last week we were talking specifically, uh, we had gotten into a, a tangent about how much liquidity to hold for your company, especially on the precipice of a downturn, which seems to be all over the news. And so we started talking about, okay, well, if it's, you know, inflation's happening, and you're holding a lot of liquidity, but there's also this, you know, recession, this looming recession coming up. What do we do? And yeah, so we went yeah. through and we broke down how we're all doing it. And we shared essentially very openly what's in our bank account, what we are doing, because it's like this concept of radical yeah, yeah. transparency. To you know, Like if your doctor didn't know what your blood pressure actually was, <laughs> or like <laughs> what your problem like actually was, like they wouldn't be able to help you. You'd be like, I'm guessing it's like, yeah, it's around this number. Like <laughs> the doctor, it would be impossible. Amazing. So that's sort of the idea. And so the GoPod is just like, you know, one week you refresh and you talk to these people that help you on your micro problems or whatever, really. It's just kind of a friendship group too. But I don't know what got us on the GoPod. Actually, <laughs> no, I'm not explaining what a GoPod is. <laughs> well, you know, I, I want to, I want to just let you have a moment here, Nick, because at the end we always say, now we were going to do a give and a get or a, a final thought from you. You know, what is one way you can kind of pour into our audience, maybe wisdom, a quote, a book that maybe you could give to our audience as something as a treasure? Totally. So the one give, and this is just because I have now read this book and it has really sculpted my mind for the better. And the book is called Unbreaking... No, hold on. Actually, yeah, let me think about what it's actually called. There's a butterfly in here. <laughs> <laughs> Did you guys see that? That was crazy. The it's butterfly. Called... I know I didn't. Yeah. So the book is called Breaking the Habit of Being Yourself. Breaking um, the Habit of Being Yourself. Yes. And the reason why I really particularly recommend this is because I think a lot of possibilities that could easily did you see i saw it you i saw did it. I, I just yeah. saw it in the camera I, you're not i'm not crazy. I'm, i'll be on butterfly watch while you finish your smart point there we go <laughs> i love it is that it reframes your brain it reframes your brain in the sense that the idea is like you brush your teeth all the time you clean your clothes all the time why aren't you refreshing your brain all the time you really need to be refreshing your brain Damn. to going back brain. looking at things that you know that are so secure that I don't like spaghetti. I do not like anchovies. I always think this way. Hey, well, maybe you made that thought assumption or you created that idea when you were seven or 12. Wow. Well, circumstances are very different now, right? Mm -hmm. Like, and yeah. just everything's different now. So wow. why don't you go back and revisit that and really percolate on it? And like really think, is yeah. this where you are not? Because when you clean house and you reorient or whatever, you'll begin to find that you could potentially be more open to easier success. It's wow. wild to think wow. about that. But that is actually the truth. Yeah, I've heard Tony Robbins talk about that, you know, when people will say some self-limiting thing, idea, and he'll say, well, how long have you been telling yourself that story? And right, yes. And them in the moment. Literally, like, literally that. It is literally that because, like, you become so rigid and so not flexible that you become your own worst enemy in achieving something because you're taking sort of like a, a historical analysis way too far into the future. Like yeah. you do have to be flexible to some degree. I mean, the goal should always relatively stay the same, but how you get there should be able to change, right? Like that's the idea. And thank you for that. So we'll put that in the show notes. And then how about, and I think maybe it relates back to Science Factory, which I'm extremely interested in, but what's one way this audience can pour back into you, Nick? Okay, so we are starting a influencer marketing company specifically for science creators. 
So if anybody out there that they know of, that they have heard of, that are in science, technology, engineering, arts, and math. So if you do a dance tutorial, if you teach people how to cook, if you're a scientist yourself, if you just like telling people about stuff and it's educational, I want you to go to scifluence.co. Um, actually, you know what? I, I actually have to, that's not that. I'll put it, I'll, I'll actually tell you what you guys is, but I want you guys to go to this website and there's a link to actually sign up. You put your information in there and that way we can reach out to you when we have a brand that wants to pay you to literally do what you're already doing. Dang, so like, I love it. We, that's what we want, yeah. That's how you can best help us. And how about finding and following you, Nick? What's the best place that you love to send traffic? Yes. So at Nick Juhas across all social media, that is the best place to find us for some really cool, fun, awesome, interesting science content. (laughs) And Nick, can you you spell that for us, please? Yes, for sure. So it's N-I-C-K-U-H-A-S. And by the way, Juhas means shepherd in Hungarian. Oh, I like that. By the way, there has to be another episode in the future where we dive into the cool businesses you've created and the way you perceive investing in real estate, all of that we didn't even get to. That's all some fun, fun stuff for our listeners. But I think you dropped so much wisdom. We're going to probably turn this into an article. It's so good. Thank you for everything, Nick. We appreciate you. <laughs> Thank you, guys. I Thanks, appreciate Nick. it. Bam! Straight! We just got, yeah, to buddy. End, we got to the end of another great show. And everyone listening right now, you're the family, family and friends. Thanks for staying till the end. That was so fun. And hey, hit the like, hit subscribe. We're here to serve you guys. That's why we're doing this show. Josh is not paying me. I'm doing this off of my quote unquote sweat equity because we want to make a difference in your life. And then that ripple effect will continue to touch the world. Hey, amen, brother. Please check us out on capitalhacking.com, all the social media threads. And yes, I know you've probably already sent this episode to one of your best friends. Thank you. We <laughs> love you. Just just go right into your iPhone, hit the plus symbol. We'll talk to you later. See you next week. Share, share, share.